All right, if you didn't uh, pick up your assignment already, you can grab that after class. Again, there were uh, two homework assignments and the quiz all coming back at you at once. Be sure to check your grade on MU Online to make sure that it matches everything that uh, you think it should. You know, occasionally when there's so many classes in a student, in a uh, section, so many students in a section, and so many assignments, I can accidentally type in on the wrong line or, uh, you know, transpose numbers. So, um, let me know if I've made any mistakes in the gradebook. All right, so you're down to the last 48 hours on the project, and now the questions are starting to come in. Um, it's a lot easier to answer those questions in person than it is uh, by email, because uh, too often I'll get questions from students without any sort of context or background, and it's difficult for me to try and interpret what exactly you mean. So if you want to stop by during my office hours, uh, I'm available just after this class, and also today, the fluid mechanics lab that I usually run in the later afternoon is canceled, and so I'll be in my office until probably around 4.30 or so. If you want to stop by, I'd be happy to talk to you. And of course, I'll still do my best to respond via email, but if you wanted to get into some really nitty-gritty details, uh, it's a lot more efficient to do that in person than it is um, in email. All right, so 48 hours from right now, you will have made a nice stack of the uh, reports. And what I'd also like you to do is upload your spreadsheet to MU Online. And that's just in case I suspect that there might be an error. It'll allow me to go in and look at what you did to give you some additional partial credit. Rather than just uh, deducting points, I'll, if I see something in your spreadsheet that looks wrong, I'll go in and see if maybe you at least had part of the idea correct. So it's to your benefit to provide the spreadsheet on MU Online, regardless of which project you did. Both projects have a spreadsheet, um, and both projects also require a written report. So only upload the spreadsheet to MU Online, but print out the report itself, including the spreadsheet. So even though you're you know, putting the Excel file on MU Online, I'd still like to have a printed copy of your spreadsheet. And please do that so that it's all on a single page, because uh, when it breaks across multiple pages, as I've discussed previously, it makes it really hard to know, especially if it's broken width-wise across multiple pages. All right. Uh, so any questions related to the project and how it's going to go down two days from now? You're welcome to turn the assignment in early. I've already got one of those. So. All right. Uh, the other thing is homework 14, which is due uh, the Wednesday after we get back from break. All right, we're going to continue talking about cost estimation today. And remember, just to review, these are different approaches that we take to try and predict before a project is completed how much it might cost to construct. And the more effort we put into a cost estimate, the more expensive it is to generate it. So wherever possible, we try and look for efficient ways to generate these estimates of costs. Now, here is a picture of a wastewater treatment plant. And when you fly any place on an airplane, uh, if you look down and you notice big circular tanks like this, and there's lots of them, they're probably not swimming pools. All right? And it's actually, it's interesting. Any city you fly into, if you look for it, you'll see these because every city has to treat their wastewater before it's discharged into a lake or a river. Um, so these are clarifiers. The circular ones are clarifiers, which is meant to allow solids to settle to the bottom of the treatment plant. And then these basins are aeration basins, which is where they're trying to force feed oxygen to micro, uh, uh, microbacteria that will break down pollutants. So this is a wastewater treatment plant. And this is a pretty big one. You can tell that there are several different clarifiers here. And so I'm just estimating here, but this looks like the treatment plant that you'd need for maybe around uh, half a million people, approximately. Now, here's a much smaller treatment plant. They've only got four clarifiers in this treatment plant. So the first thing we're going to look at today with uh, cost-capacity relationships is let's say that you had really detailed uh, financial data for how much it costs to construct this bigger treatment plant. 
maybe it would be possible if you had another project down the line to estimate in advance what the costs are going to be for the smaller wastewater treatment plant based on what you know for the larger one. Now, what could be a challenge as far as that goes? We've talked about bulk discounts in the past, and so how might that same idea apply here? What's a bulk discount? So if you buy a lot of something, you can often negotiate a discount with the supplier. So a facility that's this big may have some construction efficiencies and some material cost efficiencies that a smaller project like this couldn't capture. And so we may not be able to just scale linearly from a large facility to a small facility. So this larger one has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 clarifiers that we can see. There's probably one here too. So let's say 18 clarifiers. So this has only four. Most likely the price is not going to be four eighteenths of the bigger one. There's going to be some sort of a nonlinearity that we have to keep track of. The cost capacity equation allows us to do that. The first part of it, before we look at the exponent, if we ignore the exponent, it's pretty straightforward. It's saying, let's say that you know the price of a big thing. That, let's say C1 is the cost of that big treatment plant. We knew that it costs $20 million to build that facility. Uh, so that is C1. And Q is some measure of size. It could be the flow rate of water that that treatment plant is, um, is treating. It could be the number of people that accepts wastewater from. So let's say I, my estimate was 500,000 people. So Q1 would be 500,000 people. C1 is $20 million. So in a case like that, what if we wanted to estimate the cost for a treatment plant that's only going to serve 100,000 people? So it would be one-fifth of the $20 million. So that's the uh, linear approach. But what this is saying is there could be some correlating exponent that has to do with the fact that not everything scales linearly. So let's look at what these x values could be. If x is 1, then that's assuming that there is a linear relationship, meaning you get no discount for a big facility compared to a small facility. It's, it's all the same. The, the, uh, the scaling. If x is less than 1, that's an indication of an economy of scale, meaning that there's a cost advantage for a larger size. Um, in other words, the cost advantage for a larger size means that the more you buy of something, you're actually getting a discount per unit of that item that's being purchased. But occasionally, there are diseconomies of scale, meaning that the larger something gets, the more expensive it is to either build or to buy. And that might be because it's just getting so complicated that now new challenges are arising that wouldn't necessarily exist for the smaller version of the thing. It could be, in the case of uh, water treatment, for example, bigger facilities have more strict rules that they have to follow than smaller facilities. And so it could be that there is a diseconomy of scale that you're actually better off having two small treatment plants than one large one because you would fall under some sort of a regulatory threshold. So just as an illustration here, I'd like you to uh, put the numbers into the equation and see if you get the answer that it's said here. So we're given that a certain water treatment plant costs $1.7 million. So let's say that that C1 is $1.7 million and the size of that treatment plant is 0.5 MGD. So Q1 is 0 0.5 million gallons per day. That would be the size of the treatment plant. Now, we have a correlating exponent X of 0 0.14, and we want to find out what's the cost of a 2 million gallon per day plant. And so, in this case, Q2, is 2.0 MGD, and so we want to know what is C2. 
Now I've got it on the screen there that it's 2.06 million, but let's put it into the formula and see if that is the case. So we should have 1.7 million. The ratio of Q2 to Q1 is 2 million gallons per day to 0.5. And then you take it to the power of 0 0.14. What does that work out to? Can anyone confirm that it is 2.06 million? I see some nodding heads. All right. So let's talk more about the correlating exponent. Where does that sort of information come from? Well, tables like this. There are lots of different industries out there. Uh, wastewater treatment is just one illustration that's provided by the text. Um, there are different things that you need for a wastewater treatment plant. You may need to purchase a centrifuge for spinning things. Um, now, let's go back to the definition of correlating exponents here. If it's greater than one, that means there's a diseconomy of scale, meaning actually you get penalized for buying more instead of getting the bulk discount. So most of these have the exponent less than one, meaning that if you buy a bigger one, you're getting more value per unit purchased. But some of, them, some of these, there is a diseconomy of scale. So an aerated lagoon has a X value of 1.13. An aerated lagoon, what that basically is, is for a really small town, that maybe only has a few hundred residents, what they do, instead of putting together a fancy uh, treatment plant with lots of pumps and moving parts that could break down, if it's a small town, sometimes what they'll do is they'll just take all of the sewage into a large pond and then just stir the pond and let it break down over the long term. And that's an example of an aerated lagoon. And what this is saying is, actually, the bigger the lagoon is, the more expensive it is. Um, so that there's some sort of a disadvantage. It could be that real estate costs get uh, too prohibitively expensive as you have a larger and larger area. It could be that if you've got a really large sized lagoon, it's harder to put the, uh, the mixing apparatus in the middle of a huge pond compared to a small one. So there's just something challenging about it getting bigger. And the same is true for sludge drying beds, which is another thing that's related to just spreading material out over a very large area. Uh, at the end of wastewater treatment, you have some solids that have to be disposed of, and you need to dewater those solids. And one method is just to, dry, to, to lay it out and let the sun sort of evaporate the water in the sludge. But a sludge drying bed has a correlating exponent of greater than one, meaning that it actually is less economically viable the larger it gets. Okay, so to try these ideas out, I'm going to give you an in-class exercise that has, um, all right, it has a wastewater treatment plant that has three components, and you're going to need to estimate the cost of the, uh, of the treatment plant based on some given information about the size of it, and also given previous costs. And we're going to combine this with what we learned in class last time, which is cost indexes. Remember, when you get cost data in the past, you can use that previous cost data and project it towards today by using cost indexes. And so I've got the formula on the sheet here.
Okay, before you get started on the calculations, let's just sort of uh, read through the problem statement together to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the first thing is that we are combining the cost capacity equations with the cost indices. And so that means that there's old, old pricing data. Um, back in 2010, that's our earlier year, we had the smaller treatment plant that had this sizing and co component costs. And so these component costs are what you're going to use as the C values. And then the sizing, it may be horsepower that becomes a Q. It could be flow rate, size. And then we want to know, um, back then, the construction cost index was 137. But when this is going to be built in 2017, we project that that same construction cost index will be 164, meaning that things in the future are going to be more expensive than they were many years ago in 2010. So not only is this facility going to be a different size, but also the time value of money and the effects of inflation are uh, showing themselves. And so find the cost of each component using this formula and then add all of the component costs together. All right, let's talk about the different pieces of the cost estimation here. What we're saying is we're trying to find out how much this new aerated lagoon is going to cost to construct based on data we have from several years ago. The new one is bigger. So we have the original cost was 3.3 million, and there's a difference in size and a difference in time. So these two factors, the 3.13, that is the size factor that says how much more costly, how many times more costly it's going to be because of the increase in size. And then the 1.197 factor is the fact that prices have increased by about 20% in, uh, in the intervening years. So 1.197 adjusts for the fact that construction costs will be elevated. So we do the same thing for the lagoon, the blower, now the lagoon has a, uh, a penalty for size increases. 1.13 means that the larger you get, the more increasingly costly it is. Whereas the blower has a nice value that's below one, so that you're getting far more than double the capacity at just barely double the price, in spite of the fact that there's the, uh, the increase in cost due to time. So overall, it should be $13.5 million, approximately, for the three components together. Any questions about cost capacity equations? They're very frequently combined with the uh, cost indexes, because when you do a cost capacity equation, by definition, you're getting cost data for something that's already been completed and you're planning for a project that's in the future. So it's inevitable that there's going to be a decrease, uh, I'm sorry, a difference in cost because of just the change in time.
The uh, other thing we're going to talk about today is the factor method. And um, so the factor method is, is looking at how one component of a project sometimes can predict the overall cost of the project. So before I talk about this formula, let me just tell you about uh, eating out in Dubai. Last year I was living in Dubai, and I love to go to restaurants, but sometimes you can get into trouble finding, you know, it's a very, very expensive city. High-rise towers, the police are driving Lamborghinis, and all sorts of crazy excess. So as you'd expect, there's a lot of restaurants you go into and just, you're going to pay out the nose, you know, several hundred dollars per person. What I realized one time was that if I went into a restaurant and just looked at the price of a bottle of water, I could pretty much estimate what the whole meal was going to cost. And so if I went into a restaurant and a bottle of water was three dirhams, which is less than a dollar, then most likely my meal was going to be ten dollars, approximately. Um, I, I a couple of times realized, you know, it was about a factor of ten for, you know, when I got the appetizer, the main dish, dessert, and the drink, a bottle of water was about a, a factor of ten to the overall cost. One time, near the Burj Khalifa, which is that really tall building, I went into a restaurant, I sat down, and I noticed the bottle of water was thirty dirhams. So they wanted nearly ten dollars for a bottle of water. So I just sort of closed the menu, stood up, and made my way to the exit. Because I just wasn't in the mood. And also, you know, I'm a cheapskate. So I didn't want to throw away $100 on a meal, especially because they were doing shisha in there, which is like the, the smoke that comes in with the long pipe, you know, hubbly bubbly, sometimes it's called hookah. It just smelled like strawberry smoke in there. Plus, it was really expensive. So the idea there is that one component of a meal, the bottle of water, you can sometimes use that to factor up to what the overall project cost is going to be. So this formula is saying your total cost, including all of the components, is the cost of one piece of the project multiplied by some factor, H. So here's that illustration. My idea that a, a meal is 10 times the cost of water. So three dirhams for water, the meal is 30 dirhams. 20 dirhams for water, the meal maybe would be 200 dirhams. All right, so in the in-class uh, exercise, we're going to actually uh, take that idea and go one step further. Remember that we've talked about direct costs and indirect costs before. Well, uh, when you are estimating the overall cost of a project, you have to take into account the fact that it's more than just the equipment that you purchase. Um, in the case of the, uh, the research project that I've told you about before, you know, a big part of that expense was the drilling of the wells, but then there was also the part that we had to give to Marshall to support the, uh, the physical facilities, the utility costs, the human resources people who are uh, managing the hiring on the project, and so on, the benefits. You know, there's a lot of indirect costs that have to be accounted for as well. So what this expanded formula is saying, if you know the cost of one piece of equipment, then you have to add up all of the factors for the direct costs. And so one plus the direct cost factors. And so then inside these brackets is going to be the overall direct costs of the project. But then you also have to account for the indirect costs that expand the amount that you're going to spend. And so now for the, uh, the second part of our in-class exercise today, what I'd like you to do is consider the situation of a diesel generator that is costing uh, uh, $975,000. This says dirhams, but uh, I mean dollars there. That says dollars on your paper. The cost factor for pouring the concrete pad is 0.39. Uh, that means that Approximately, the, uh, the concrete pad accounts for 39% of the direct costs. And then the uh, operator training is 16%. So if we go back to this formula from the previous slide, you're having to add together all of the cost factors, and you know two of the cost factors, 
that will be incorporated into that. So 0 0.39, 0 0.16, you'll add it to the uh, to this in the parentheses and multiply it by the cost of the major equipment. And the exercise here that we know is that it is $975,000 for the, uh, for the uh, diesel generator. So there are other components there that we have to also account for. And then the indirect cost is 27% in this. So 0.27 is what you'll have to use for the other part of the equation. So the idea behind this um, example is that all you have to do is get a quote for one component of the overall system and then just as a rule of thumb whoever is doing this knows that usually that uh, operator training is a certain amount of the money that's being spent that the uh, the concrete pad the generator is sitting on is a certain fraction of the fixed component that we do have the cost data for so that if you have done enough uh, work in your field, you kind of have an idea of what these fractions are. Like when I had a new concrete driveway put in at my house, all the guy really had to do was look at the area. And he knew basically how much it was going to cost him in the form work, meaning the wood that goes on the outside of where the concrete's being poured. He had a basic idea of how much he's going to spend on the uh, excavator had an idea how much the aggregate's going to cost, just because if you know one component, then you can scale it up and predict the entire project based on that piece of data. All right, I want to tell you a few more things about the project, since we have some extra time. Uh, the project that's due on uh, Friday is a little bit different from the things that you've been submitting in this class so far. The quizzes, the assignments, homework, uh, exams, all of those have one right answer. You know, it's like you're working towards a single correct answer. And you get points taken off if you make mistakes, but as long as you show your approach, you get partial credit. Now, the projects that you're going to be turning in on Friday, there is a one correct answer for the, uh, for the, um, the pump storage project, but there's not one answer for the personal finance thing. And so, um, Part of what you have to do in a project that requires a report is explain your thinking and the rationale for things. Uh, help to document the research that you've done, the supporting research. Because in the case of the, uh, you know, planning for a comfortable retirement and figuring out what your expenses are going to be, uh, I'm not going to give the same number of points to someone who just said, I spend $3,000 a year in food. You know, just pick some number out of the air without any supporting rationale. It wouldn't be fair to give the same number of points to that person as to someone who did a detailed estimate based on a trip to the grocery store and a list of the items that they plan to purchase and so on. And so part of the, uh, the points that are going to be awarded for this report is the clarity of uh, your communication and helping the reader to understand what your process was. It's partly about the depth of your detail and how well you can document it. Uh, and so if you correctly identify the references that you used with the, uh, the web link and also who owns the website and the date that it was accessed, you know, I don't have a specific requirement on whether you use footnotes or endnotes or APA citation style or the Chicago style. You know, I, I don't care what method you use as long as it's consistent and as long as it communicates the information that's needed for me to understand what your assumptions are based on. And so the reason I bring it up is I just wanted to sort of shake you loose of the mentality of it doesn't matter what you turn in as long as you get some right answer. In this case, um, kind of the accessibility and neatness of it is going to be a factor of the grade. So I'd encourage you to uh, try and make it easy for me to absorb because I'm going to have 44 projects that I'm going to be looking at over the Thanksgiving break. And I'm excited to do that. 
but you need to sort of meet me halfway. I'm going to do my best to understand what you did, but you also need to you know, put some effort into communicating it clearly with good figures, good tables, good documentation. And so uh, keep that in mind. I'll see you in class on Friday, and have a good one.